G'day everyone. Uh, welcome. I can see uh, all our attendees uh, piling up on the side there. I think we've got about a thousand people registered for today's webinar. Thanks so much for coming along. We really appreciate it. I'm Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our 2021 webinar series. I'd like to begin by stating that Canberra is Ngunnawal country. That's where I live and work and pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land and to elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd also like to welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us today and preface this discussion with a warning that uh, some of the discussion may touch on some distressing issues and a warning that we might also mention the names of deceased people. The same as last year, our webinar series, we're aiming to do them at least weekly, but the days and times do vary. So please head to our website at australiainstitute.org.au events so that you don't miss out. And just a few tips before we begin today's webinar to help it all run smoothly. I'm sure you're all old hands at Zoom by now, but if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A function where you can type in questions for Amy and you should also be able to upvote questions from other people and make comments. Please keep things civil in the chat. We don't often have to boot people out, but we will if we have to. So uh, please keep an eye on that. And lastly, just a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and it will be posted up on our website and emailed to everyone after this discussion. So last week, uh, we talked about the long history of right-wing extremism and right-wing uh, white supremacy in Australia with Dr. Anne Alley. And this week we confront uh, another way that white supremacy manifests itself here in this country through our criminal justice system, which over polices and over incarcerates Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So to talk about these issues in depth, I'm delighted to introduce journalist and author, Amy McGuire. Amy is a Durrambul and South Sea Islander woman from Rockhampton uh, and she was the National Indigenous Times first female editor and also their first Aboriginal editor. She's previously worked at NITV, New Matilda, Buzzfeed, and has written for a variety of other publications, including The Engine, The Griffith Review, The New York Times, and Guardian Australia. In 2020, she was pretty busy. She was undertaking a PhD at the University of Queensland. And if that wasn't enough, she was also the recipient of the Australia Institute's Writer in Residence program in 2020 and she came and worked with us for a couple of weeks on her book. Her upcoming book, The Water Behind Us, is a journalistic investigation into the wrongful conviction for murder um, uh, of Aboriginal man, Kevin Henry. And the book deals with some complex intersections of how race, gender, class, and Aboriginality interact with the law. She's also the co-host of the investigative podcast, Curtain, about that case of Kevin Henry. And when the Black Lives Matter protest came to global prominence last year, Amy wrote a particularly searing piece for the Saturday paper about Aboriginal deaths in custody, titled, There Cannot Be 432 Victims and No Perpetrators. And I'm sure many of you read that at the time. So welcome, Amy. Thank you for joining us. I'm almost just exhausted reciting that list of your accomplishments. You had <laughs> such a good year last year. We really appreciate your time today. Um, I did want to kick off with a question about that book um, that you came to us for a couple of weeks to keep writing. Um, how did you come across the story of Kevin Henry and what has compelled you to pursue his case so doggedly, I guess? Um, yeah, well, it was actually, I'd heard about his, ca his case from a cousin in Rockhampton at the time who was his advocate and I'd heard about it um, a year before we started looking into it. Um, and there had always been, and when I heard about it, um, I just asked around Rocky in the local, like Aboriginal population, just local mob around. Um, and immediately there were questions raised about his innocence. So this was a story that was talked about by mob in Rockhampton, um, but wasn't known outside of Rocky or even had been forgotten in Rocky. And the yeah. reason it had been forgotten, not only because Kevin Henry is an Aboriginal man, but also the victim was an Aboriginal woman named Linda. Um, and within basically a week of her death, um, the story had fallen off the front page. It had been um, spoken about as if it was a life lifestyle crime. It was seen as a black on black crime. So mm -hmm. there, there were ways that the dehumanization of the victim, but also the alleged perpetrator um, had an effect that people largely did not care. Um, but Aboriginal community in Rockhampton cared. 
And one person who I particularly started to think, oh, well, we have to look into this case was my dad because he'd been an Aboriginal prison guard at Capricornia Correctional Center for the majority of my life since I was one to about, I think I was like 20 something when he left. And about 10 years into, he was on duty the night Kevin had been convicted. And he always thought, well, that's a weird case. The guards at the time had actually spoken about it, who'd sat in on the trial said, well, we don't know about this one. Yeah. But then 10 years later, um, Kevin had actually told um, dad one time that he was innocent and that a police officer had a, held a gun to his head and forced him to confess. And so that's how I sort of started to think, well, why isn't, why hasn't anyone really looked into this case before? Um, and then I um, did an interview with Martin Hodgson, who's a UN human rights lawyer based in Bega, whose focus is wrongful convictions. And I told him, like, maybe you should look into this case. Um, and within a month, he'd found evidence that, you know, supported Kevin's claims of innocence. So it really just started there. And it had that snowball effect where once we found that early evidence, it just continued to build up. And, you know, we have such a compelling case of innocence for Kevin and nothing we have found that even you know, supports his guilt or the court or the police's version, version of events. Yeah. And so before we kind of get into maybe some of the more systemic issues, for people who aren't familiar with the case, can you just give us a little summary, starting with the murder of Linda and kind of, um, I guess, where, where we find things now for Kevin Henry? Yeah, and it was quite a distressing case. So um, I might not go into detail specifically about what happened out of respect for her family, um, but basically, um, in 1991, in September, she was found um, in the Fitzroy River. And it was a really horrendous crime. Um, so within five days of um, finding her body, four people had been charged with murder. There was three women who'd been charged in relation to an assault that had been perpetrated against um, Linda before she died. Um, and they ended up getting grievous bodily harm. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of evidence to support that they did um, perpetrate that assault. Um, but the person who got the largest sentence was Kevin Henry. Um, and he was given a life sentence for murder. Um, but when we started to look into the case, we realized that there was no actual evidence to support that conviction. Yeah. Um, and in fact, that there was a confession, which wasn't really a confession. Um, and a lot of Australians or just regular people will think, well, how do you confess to a crime that you didn't commit? Martin Hodgson had actually done a, work, a lot of work on death penalty cases in America, a lot of cases over in the Middle East, in Italy, all over the place where he knew that the reality of um, false confessions. So he was actually able to look at Kevin's confession and find all of the holes um, in that confession. Um, and so one of the problems was that it was a joint trial and Kevin didn't have proper um, adequate defense. Um, and so when even you just look at the trial transcripts, he should have never been convicted in the first place. There was no evidence at all. Yeah. Um, so that was, it's a very complicated case and you have to sort of crouch it in the context of what was happening on the riverbank, but also what happened in Rockhampton and the entire history of police interactions with Aboriginal mob and the history of intergenerational trauma. So that's why it becomes quite a complicated um, and sensitive story to talk about in that sense. And that was one of the hard things in approaching this story was thinking, how do you write about this case in ways that supports Kevin's claims, but also does not compound the violence against the victim, yeah. which had already been perpetrated, had been compounded not only in the police investigation, but also in the courts where she was largely just left out. And it was just the wounds of her body reinscribed. So it was very, it's very hard to sort of talk about these issues in ways that do not further compound this already horrendous violence. Um, against the victim and also against Kevin. He was traumatised within the justice system, not just in this case, but throughout his whole life from when he was a young kid being locked up in juvenile detention to now being, you know, um, even now after he's been out, you know, like the the effects that 20 something years of wrongful incarceration has had on him, you know, and he's yeah. currently trying to heal from that. Yeah, so I think uh, that kind of brings us to some of those systemic issues, but you were talking about the, you know, the history of police violence with mob in Rockhampton, but, you know, for white people, we're often taught, you know, that if you're ever in trouble, go to the police and that's who you mm. trust and they're in authority and they will help you. But obviously that's really not the experience of Aboriginal people in this country at all. And there's really good reasons for that history of um distrust yeah can you just kind of talk about some of those systemic issues that come up 
uh, through that case uh, or that became apparent for you while you were looking into, into Kevin's case? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely just the space in which they were, first of all, um, you know, living at the time. So the crime actually happened um, in Tanuba House, was, which was a local Aboriginal um, drug and alcohol rehabilitation centre. And it was a safe place um, for the most part because mob would go there largely to um, get be safe from the eyes of police. They were over surveilled in Rockhampton and they were looked down upon. Um, and I feel like, you know, a lot of like non-Indigenous mob in non-Indigenous people in Rockhampton have no idea about, you know, the experiences of policing um, by Aboriginal people on the riverbank. It was a very different space, you know, um, the space in which Linda died was seen as sort of this degenerate space. And so her body was seen as not worthy of mourning or worthy of justice. Um, and so there was very early on those um, problems around over surveillance. Um, in relation to policing, but also police brutality in the sense that a lot of mob I've talked to in relation to this story around that time, we're talking about, you know, I think um, there's this there's this assumption that blackfellas shouldn't be believed and that police should be believed in these cases. But so many mob just had experiences of police brutality, you know, whether like telephone book being used against them, yeah. you know, like actual, you know, these really horrendous cases, but they'd just never been believed. And this was the time, it was in 1991, it was just after the Royal Commission. And in this case, Linda, the victim, her brother had died a horrendous death in custody and was one of the 99 cases um, investigated by the Royal Commission. Um, and so that brings up a whole other host of issues um, because his was a violent death in custody as well. Mm -hmm. And there was no justice for his death and it was one of the most high profile. So there are all these issues um, in relation to it. The other thing was when Kevin was picked up and largely, we just think they went around and tried to find any black fella to, to get for this crime because it was just such a shoddy investigation. When they brought him in, he asked three times for a lawyer and he was each time refused. So that's a key indicator of a false confession, whether there's a lawyer present. While they were interviewing him, he's sort of just agreeing to a lot of questions. Um, he's very confused about what's happening. So there's a, these issues around gratuitous concurrence. There's all, also issues which we know in um, wrongful confessions. You know, you're just agreeing because you don't really understand what's happening, but you just want to leave because you know you didn't do this crime. Yeah. And then there was the central yeah. allegation. Yeah, and then there was an allegation, which I believe Kevin, because he said it and he's maintained it, that he was, um, a gun was put to his head and forced him to confess. So, I mean, there's so many issues because then I can start talking about the courts and how the defense lawyer just did not stand up for Kevin and the jury. Because when you go through the transcripts, there is nothing really about Kevin other than this confession. And so what I'm thinking, and I wasn't in the courtroom and like, we can't ask the jury obviously, but what I think is that they just heard these details of violence in the riverbank and they just saw this, you know, black fellow and thought, well, you know, he must have done it. That's how I think sometimes the most simpler, simple um, explanations of what happened. A neat little box. Yeah. So, I mean, in sorry, I'm probably going all over the place, but in Kevin's case, it's such a complicated story, but there's so many elements of it that speak to the wider problems um, with the justice system and how it treats Aboriginal people. But yeah. it goes back to that central theme, I think, of not caring about the lives of Aboriginal women or Aboriginal men, but particularly Aboriginal women. I feel like that is what this case is all about that Linda was never respected enough um, for the media did not want just did not care enough to pursue justice for her. Um, and ultimately, you know, she never got true justice because the man who was convicted is innocent. And there's just snowball effect of, you know, this further violence being perpetrated against not just only him, but his community who have always believed in his innocence. So I think it comes down to that central um, element of Aboriginal women not being respected and not being valued by this justice system that is overwhelmingly violent towards us. And I just wanted to bring up another issue around the Royal Commission is that it did not, and this is a critique made by a lot of Aboriginal women like Professor Megan Davis, is that it did not look adequately at gender. Mm -hmm. A lot of Aboriginal women at the time, like Judy Atkinson, a lot of um, people around the time were talking about the fact that we actually have to look at family violence and also police brutality specifically against Aboriginal women. And that was never brought up. And that was an issue that I felt kept coming out because Linda died in the same year as that the Royal Commission came out. And yet there was silence around her death and so many other Aboriginal women who died um, around that time and which we're still, you know, wanting justice for. And not just Aboriginal women, Barrowville children died in 991, you know? So there was, and that's a continuing fight for justice. And that's 
similar issues around police inadequacy. They blamed the community. Um, they said they were, you know, they were looking into them for child abuse. They just didn't care enough to go and actually find the people who did it. Um, and as well. Who yeah. in those situations gets the benefit of the doubt and it's never... No, <laughs> never. No, well, Aboriginal people are just never believed. Yeah. Around that time, there was also a, a um, I think it was Hiri Up did this report into police brutality all around the country. When you read that report, you hear the voices of um, Aboriginal mob, particularly like young people as well, were talking about their experiences of police brutality. Um, and, you know, like the fact we had this report, I was just reading back the report and thinking of the fact it happened in the same year that Linda died. You know, like black followers are just not believed when they talk about experiences of um police brutality and that's something that's continual today yeah and I think that maybe brings us back to your Saturday paper article from uh last year so when uh George Floyd was killed and there was that awful video footage that everyone was kind of able to witness and it uh really took the Black Lives Matter protest to an, another level and um and they went global and I was really struck at the time by your Saturday paper article of, you know, there can't be more than 430 black deaths in custody and no perpetrators. And at the time you wrote that no police officer had ever been convicted of an Aboriginal death in custody. I know that there's been a couple of police officers charged in relation in the last couple of years, but is that still the case? No one's ever been convicted? Um, yes, I mean, we've had a couple of, uh, there have been charges laid and we're currently waiting on the trials of um, Mr. Walker in Uindamu and um, Ms. Clark in Geraldton. And also there was a, um, oh, well, there's a correctional officer who's been charged with manslaughter over Dwayne Johnston in Lismore. But yeah, I mean, from what, there has never been conviction. And I think that's the problem when we talk a lot um, is that there's an obscuring of the perpetrator or the violence that has been enacted about against Aboriginal people in this system. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of Aboriginal mob have been working to make that violence visible so people see it. And a big problem in relation to the way coronial inquests or the language that um, death in custody is spoken of is this idea of natural causes. So it's seen as if Aboriginal mob are dying at natural causes. So that automatically obscures and stops any calls for accountability. When you look at these cases that they talk about natural causes, you see that actually you know, there, there are actual layers of violence that are being perpetrated against Aboriginal mob from the health system and the justice system, but that intersection of both. Mm. Um, and so these aren't just cases of natural causes. And actually, when I was down in the Australia Institute, um, I was just looking back into the case of Moranji Dumaji, and I was reading the early reporting. And the early reporting, there was actually a death in custody in the same day, I think, as Moranji, which, you know, was seen as a natural cause. But also Malranji's death was first reported as a natural cause, as if it was some sort of, you know, he just died and they called an ambulance. So it spoke to this idea of benevolence on behalf of police. And automatically there was attempts to stop questions and also frame the very valid and justifiable questions of Palm Islanders who actually were listening to their own witnesses who were resisting police versions of events very early on. They were framing um, these very valid questions from black witnesses as a rational and violent and ex, um, evidence of the tensions that were building on Palm Island at the time. So you see the way that black witnesses are slandered automatically in ways that obscure the accountability of police, but not yeah. just police, health professionals, correctional officers, all of these people who are involved in this system that is all ultimately as a whole violent towards our people and yet we're blamed for that violence. Yeah. You know, that's what I really was said to me, Melrangi's blamed and also he was tarred as violent when yeah. really mob at the scene said no he wasn't being a public nuisance. and she just locked him up because he was black and walking down the street yeah I remember I was in parliament house at the at the time of his death and that uh, kind of narrative about the the violence and riots and all of that uh did begin really early and it it, it really does obscure from the actual well what happened in that yeah. in that death and kind of just takes it all off in a, in a different direction and means that, yeah, the accountability was so hard to come by because, you know, everyone's distracted over here um, with something else. But you're right about that, that um, the undermining of the, the Black witnesses and the stories that we were hearing from Palm Island at the time, um, yeah, uh, really, really got obscured or minimized or undermined, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so 
at that time, I, always, I also thought in that article where you talked a lot about how there is a, a huge history of uh, Black resistance and trying to tell those stories, but um, that it's been really hard for the Aboriginal community to give those deaths in custody the prominence that we gave to George Floyd's death and to the deaths that we see uh, in America. Um, so I wonder if you can just speak a little bit to that difficulty and that history and how important it is for Australia. You know, obviously it's good that we support the Black Lives Matter movement and um, oppose that police violence in America, but we're not really doing enough to address our own situation. Yeah, and I think um, people, you know, people assume about the fact that, you know, when the video footage was shot and was beamed around the world, um, showing George Floyd being, you know, it was a murder on camera. Mm. The footage was so shocking, it sort of um, catapulted it to public attention and international outrage. But we have also had similar cases um, in which CCTV footage has shown horrendous brutality perpetrated against Aboriginal mob who've died in custody. And it just does never gain um, the prominence that it deserves. Um, and I think, and largely that footage has been released because of the concerted effort and campaigning of families who've taken on that burden. Um, mm. And it's a traumatic thing. Like if you think about, you know, what if it was your, you know, if your sister or your loved one had died, would you want the, that footage to be out there? Because after 10 years, do you still want that footage to be out there? They're actually really troubling questions um, and almost like this horrendous burden that Aboriginal families have to take in order just to push Australia to care. And that this footage, it's almost like they just, they don't care because I think they're seeing Aboriginal bodies in a certain way and they're seeing the violence that's being in there. They might not see it as violence, first of all. You know, when I look at um, what, ha you know, the, the footage that come out, Mr. Briscoe up in Alice Springs, he had done nothing wrong. He'd been arrested for being drunk in public. That's all he'd done. Um, he wasn't arrested, first of all. He was put into um, the watch house. But when I saw that footage, I'm like, how does this, this case not change everything? Because that to me was brutal. So I'm thinking, you know, Australians look at that case and think, well, that violence against, you know, a black body, that's where he is supposed to be. That's inevitable. That's legitimized violence. It's not even violence to them. And I think that's part of the problem. They're not seeing this violence and they're not, first of all, they're not seeing Aboriginal mob as human or they're seeing us as, you know, being locked up is not just inevitable, but legitimate. You know, like that's where we're supposed to be and that's where we're, you know, we're supposed to die in a sense. So I think that's part of the problem because that's what I was thinking. I'm like, we have CCTV footage. It's not a question of getting the CCTV footage released. Yeah. We have a lot of footage of police brutality that supports the, the version of events of Black witnesses and yet Black witnesses are still not believed. When mm -hmm. you look at the injuries of Mulrungi's body, that supports all of the Black witnesses' accounts over that of Chris Hurley, who is implicated in his death. So who do you believe? It's amazing how it's supposed to be just the burden on the black witness is so heavy compared to that on like white witnesses, like police officers. Yeah. yeah so it's just unbelievable. Cause I just think nah, how can you look at that footage and not care? And Miss yeah. June, like that was, there is violence in this footage. And I also don't think the family should have to have that violence out there for people to care. You yeah. know, I don't think Australians should have to just, it seems to me almost like entertainment in a sense sometimes. You know, because it, it can be an extra burden when you've gone all that time and then Australians are still debating about whether there should be charges or there should be further further mm. calls for justice. That to me is just, you know, another form of violence in itself, I think, to put that burden on families who are already grieving. Yeah, and that would be incredibly distressing, as we say, to have that footage out there. You know, the internet never forgets and it yeah. would just be always there to re-traumatise you. Um, Another thing I wanted to pick up on from that Saturday, I think it was in the Saturday paper article, you talked about another death of Ms. Marr um, and the custody notification service that operates in New South Wales. I believe that was one of the calls of the Royal Commission. It was implemented in New South Wales, but not everywhere else. And you talked about how in the story of her death, the focus really became on the fact that nobody called to that custody yeah. notification service instead of to me, the issue is, well, why do you need that to keep an eye on police? Why can't we just trust police to look after the welfare of Aboriginal people? And obviously that's a measure to help ensure that accountability. And I believe that was perhaps one of the first deaths since that custody notification service came in. But it really doesn't get to that 
actual original problem that Aboriginal people aren't safe in custody. Mm. And that's the reason for the service. Yeah, I mean, that's what I heard, because obviously the custody notification service is really important and it should be funded. But um, it was just... Before we get into it, it is, they did withdraw funding or reduce the funding for it. And now, you know, they accept donations to try and make up that shortfall to keep the service going. So, sorry, continue. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, But I just had a lot of problems with that story. And it's something, you know, me and Martin would always talk about. Um, Just because... I felt like it over, I mean, first of all, in relation to the CNS, the police, it was just a matter of police procedure. You know, the police actually weren't required to call the CNS at all because she had not been arrested. Yeah. Um, first of all, there were so many questions that should have been raised very early on. So I think it comes back to what are the questions that we have to actually be asking? I felt like that CNS narrative dominated so much that it totally obscured. And they, these were questions being asked of the family. So in a protest like about, I think it was a, a week after or a month after Miss Ma's death, like her mother actually raised these questions. Well, why was my daughter in a watch house? She hadn't done anything wrong. Why didn't they call me? Because I was just at home and I was a safe place where they could have taken her and she would still be alive today. And those two questions like were fundamental, I thought. So, and there were questions being asked of the by the family who knew and what come out of the inquest, um, you know, was that she shouldn't have, she was being approached for a bail breach, but she hadn't breached bail. And they've just picked her up for being intoxicated. She wasn't intoxicated. They claimed that she um, had HIV. She didn't have HIV. And that affected the way they dealt with her. They mimicked her in really highly racialized images. And then they said that they didn't know she was Aboriginal, even though her family is known as being an Aboriginal family in that area. So there are all these, this successive wave of violent events that was perpetrated against Miss Ma that never came out. And the effect of that was that they changed um, the requirements. So the CNS, even if you're not, um being arrested they still have to recall the legal so that's that most likely would not have saved Miss Ma's life mm. you know what I mean like there were all these other things that happened to her and first of all she should never have been in custody the police if they picked her up they could have taken her to um to her mother's house and that was actually what they should have done which was in their own requirements and so there are all these things that just I think it's that thing around the obscuring of the violence again um and not naming it as violent and so that sort of stops any um, further calls for or, or momentum for accountability, but her family are still grieving. Her family is still mourning. They don't have her here today, and her she has four children. And I know her mother has, you know, it's just absolutely. I mean, Aris, I feel like even black media, all of mainstream media, fail um, failed Miss Ma, but all other cases in which we're not asking the right questions, you know, and not getting to the heart of what's actually happening, you know, it yeah I don't know it's just yeah it's such an outrage and the fact that even after last year we're still having death in custodies and yet we still don't have Australians looking at it and going well actually you know this is incredibly wrong you don't need to know the numbers you don't need to have 400 something deaths all you have to do is look at one death in custody case and see how violent it is and you see all of the problems with with what is actually happening and being perpetrated against Aboriginal people in ways that don't not perpetrated against non-Indigenous people at all. Yeah. They're highly racialized. Um, so we might go now to questions from all the audience. So just a reminder to everyone uh, that you can uh, type out a question for Amy. Um, I think we've got about 500 people uh, on this webinar with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I'll pick up on a question here from Melina Smith, which I think um, talks about a point that you just made, Amy. She asks, what elements do you think um, the Australian media have in enabling and normalising ugly stereotypes for Indigenous groups? I mean, I think they've had such a huge role because that's media have been used um, to secure the settler colonial projects against Aboriginal people. So these representations of Aboriginal mob, men as violent savages, women as like disposable without agency, without love, who aren't loved or don't love. Those are images that have been perpetrated from colonial times and they're reborn in current representations. So it's the media actually re-perpetrating it. So I think it's the media as a structure that is violent towards Aboriginal mom because I say violent because they have real-time consequences. And we saw that the biggest example of that is the anti-intervention. I mean, that's just a case in point of how lying about Aboriginal men, slandering them as pedophiles. And also there was this lie that wasn't really picked up at the time that Aboriginal women did not care about children. 
that we were passive, that we needed people to speak for us, that justified this really horrendous political strategy of racism. It was racist. It was a racist policy and you had to name it as that. So it's not just the media is this innocent arm. It's actually complicit in this violence and the justification of the violence. And I'm starting to think because I, you know, um, I'm starting to think it's, you know, it's the structure and it's even just the way of journalism, the way we do journalism, that can be the problem. Um, the methods of journalism, I think, can go against Aboriginal ways of sto storytelling and knowing, um, which I think, you know, you can have like a perfectly fine piece that fits, you know, every standard of journalism. There's nothing wrong with it by those standards, but when it's applied to Aboriginal mob, you see it chain you know I don't know how to explain it properly but I see it more as yeah like that institution that system that's the problem yeah well I often reflect that parliament is you know very partisan because it's an adversarial system you know it's an opposition against the government and question time is very much set up that way in the same way that a courtroom is but uh journalism in some ways thrives on conflict and having yeah. you know like um, but the authority the knowers are the white yeah. The ones who are perpetrating violence, you know what I mean? And we're supposed to be objective. That's there's nothing yeah. objective. I mean, that's we know that's a lie. Everyone knows that's a lie. So um, so there's another question here that kind of touches on uh this. And um Kate McMahon has asked, how do you look after yourself and your well-being considering the amount of trauma that you report on and the ongoing trauma of colonization? And I'm sure that's not just an issue for you, but um many journalists who report in these spaces. Definitely. And Kate's awesome because she's at from Dart Centre. <laughs> um, so I've learned a lot from Kate and Dart Centre in strategies to do that. I also just find strength in mob. I don't know if that's even, yeah, but I, I actually find strength in a lot of the stories. You know, so they'll be very traumatic stories, but they're also stories of strength and resistance. So I actually get a lot of strength from Black witnesses themselves who are just, you know, some of the stories are just so, so multiple layers of violence and yet there's this these acts of resistance. And I think that's what is that foundation, I think, because it's also the foundation that keeps you going. You know what I mean? Like you don't, like particularly in relation to Kevin, like there's no way we could have ever abandoned Kevin's story because Kevin was still sitting in jail while we were doing it. And so it was very important for us to get out. But even now, you know, we're trying to get him exonerated. We don't have that, that luxury of forgetting about this because this is like happening right now. But I get that strength from Kevin. He's the most strongest person I've ever met. You know, the ways he has resisted not only 29 years of wrongful incarceration, but throughout his whole life is just absolutely phenomenal. So I think that's the key to, for me anyway, um, is through that, so. Um, and we did have someone ask uh, if Kevin's not exonerated yet, can you just explain uh, why he's now out of, out of jail? Yeah, so we actually had to work a lot for the parole process. So it was important for us because he was actually um, we were really worried about him while he was in prison because it is a violent place, but he was sick. Like he's middle-aged now. He went in when he was 22. Not just, you know, so the trauma of that incarceration, but also just we were worried about his health. Mm -hmm. And so our first step was actually working um, in, you know, with his lawyers to try and get him parole. And that was a really hard process. For I probably can't exactly say exactly why, but that will come out in due time. But so it was very important for us to focus on um, parole. In relation to exoneration, it's actually the first time in Queensland that we'll have a case like this. So we're actually, we have to petition the governor. And so we're working on that now. It's gonna be quite intense because it's literally a first time. I just wanted to say also, there's a man down in um, Adelaide, Yadala prison, Derek Bromley, who served over 33 years in prison for a crime he did not do. And so we're waiting to see what's happening next with his case. Um, but if you look into Derek Bromley's case, it's an absolute outrage. It's connected to um, Colin Menock, who was the dodgy forensic pathologist down in um, South Australia. And I think all eyes should be on both Derek Bromley and Kevin Henry's cases, because when you look at their cases, you just see how screwed up the justice system is. Um, in relation to Aboriginal mob. And yeah, I just feel like Derek Bromley is not talked about enough. If you look into that case, you'll just see how absolutely disgusting it is. And he's still in jail. He hasn't gotten parole yet. And he's been yeah. there for 30 years. Wow. Yeah. Um, Jefferson DeMayo has asked, how has Kevin's case impacted the community and the justice system? And has there been any progress towards reform within the police justice system? It has in the sense that stuff we can't really talk about that's ongoing. But um, I think just in relation to the community, because, yeah, there was this just 
this is a really amazing thing because Kevin's from Wurri. Everyone in Wurri and Rocky knew that Kevin was innocent. But it's so hard to know because we haven't had a case like this. You don't know where to go, really. I mean, where would you even know how to start? The only reason um, we were all just because Martin had um, so much experience overseas and working in overseas cases. So I think um, just in the sense that the community has also seen their, you know, hopes realized and Kevin's mother was literally just waiting for the day he would be released and that was something that was really important his father passed away while he was still incarcerated which was really sad yeah. so I think just having Kevin back in community and being a part of community has been really important um, but yeah we're hoping to um, continue that fight this year and just keep building momentum um, for his case the next question is from Nelly Samandari. She asks, can you please talk a little bit more about intergenerational trauma and its impact um, on systemic oppression? Um, well, I'd say it's, I mean, it's one of the key issues because um, it's not, you know, people sort of talk about it in simple terms, but it actually has real, you know, physiological, psychological, biological effects that has continued from colonisation. But it's not just, I think people just think, I mean, this is the problem with Australia. They think everything happened in the past. It didn't just happen in the past. It's actually, um, there's been violence that's been reborn and continued. Um, but a lot of people focus on, you know, violence in an interpersonal sense. It's because this state sanctioned violence, this violence that's legitimated by Australia is not seen, but that's the perpetrator and the continual um, perpetrator of this trauma, a lot of Aboriginal mobs. So it's, um, key to a lot of, I mean, it's central to a lot of issues that we're they're seeing today, which mob are continually blamed for. Um, and that's why a lot of mob talk about healing and, and ways we can heal. And I think justice and truth telling is tied up in that as well. Mm. Um, the next question is from Dan Feely. And he asks, or he says, last night on the news, I saw footage of a police officer repeatedly throw an Aboriginal man's head into a wall. I didn't see that, but that sounds awful, Dan. Uh, the judge decided that it was reasonable force. How is justice achieved in such a case? It's a really big question, Dan. Yeah, I mean, I don't know unless I was able to see the case, but I think that's the horrendous part of it is it is seen as reasonable force and justified. Um, and often, like, I think, I think even one of the things was asked, you know, it's about police investigating police. And when these incidents happen, police are very quick and the media machine is very quick to come out and say, well, no, it was justified. Or there are all these lines even before an investigation has had, has been had. So I think that, I think the public pressure is really important as well to say, well, actually there's something wrong here, but they often try to justify it by claiming, you know, Aboriginal mob as criminal automatically, you know, as soon as you're even in an interaction with police, you're seen almost as criminal. Um, and you're seen as violent. So there's those different ways um, that people are seeing it. Um, so I think that's that's one of the problems, the issues around police investigating police and police being let off and police being seen as the primary authorities, um, which is a huge problem in Australia, I think. Mm. Um, Amy, you did mention to me that you're contributing to another book called Black Witness. Um, do you just want to talk a little bit about that and, and what people might find in that book? Yeah, so Blackness is actually the book that I've got to get out in, yeah, this year. So it's just a collection of essays, um, of sort of of journalism, but past issues I've reported on around that theme of the Black Witness and around those themes of why the Black Witness is not believed um, in all these different cases, but why you should believe the Black Witness. And it sort of come from um, this piece I did in Mianjin, where I was sort of looking around the issue of um, when Carrie Ann Kennelly and Joe Hildebrand were on Channel 7 and basically, you know, this continual racist diatribe, which wasn't even new, about, you know, Invasion Day protesters shouldn't protest, they should care about, you know, violence in Aboriginal communities, which is totally, you know, ridiculous because a lot of the mob who were protesting also worked directly in relation to these issues. So it wasn't actually about them caring, it's about them getting on their high horse, but it was sort of just seeing the differences in the black and white witness um, and how the white witness positions themselves as war correspondents reporting on a war that they are not a part of. And yeah. so they they zone us into certain spaces and what, that's why there's so much focus on remote Australia as this, this hub of, you know, um, violence and savagery when that is not the truth at all. 
um, and they don't need mob speaking for them. Some of the most amazing protest movements we've had in history, like the Wakefield Walk Off, happened in remote Australia. So there's um, techniques that the white ministers are using in, in ways to position themselves as almost like war correspondents in ways that obscure the complicity that the media, but also Australia has in the current situation. So that's like it on a broad level, just yeah. those themes. But it's an interesting point. And I think it happens uh, in, in other issues as well, but that idea of, well, uh, you can't talk or care about this thing unless you also care about this other thing over there, but how rare would it be for the media to be reporting on, you know, violence in remote communities as its own issue? Well, they do it in a way that silences average. It's a silencing tactic. We saw that in oh, my, so many ways, um, but it becomes an unsafe space for a lot of Aboriginal women to speak on um, violence. We have so many Aboriginal women working in this area who've been ignored. Ani Judy Atkinson, Hannah McGlade, um, Professor Marlene Longbottom. Um, so many people that I'm probably even missing out, you know, um, who've continued, and even just in community working on a grassroots level, um, who are working in relation to this space. And yet, their efforts are totally silenced and they're silenced when we talk about solutions um, in, in you know, debates that become political ways to further violence against our people. And I mentioned the intervention again, like that's the key example of it. So it becomes very unsafe for us to even to speak about violence because it's gonna be seized upon for these political agendas. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a bigger issue even than that. I think it's, you know, this political agenda to further um, these really horrendous policies that are continually perpetrated against our people. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Hannah McGlade. <laughs> um, uh, says that agree with the media analysis and we need more diversity urgently to raise the cases and issues and asks, Amy, have you any views about law schools and how we can get them to commit in practice to anti-racism in the law? Oh, I'm not sure about that, eh? <laughs> That's something I don't think... Um... I'm an expert in at all. So um, my focus has largely been just on, it's not even been on mainstream media, it's been on building up black media in order to be able to ask these questions, but tell, tell these stories, but also like issues, complicated issues about violence and how we report on it in ways that don't further um, dehumanize um, Aboriginal mob. But I think that's been the key part. I think there's, you know, there are issues in relation to the law that aren't being talked about. And I think one of those is, you know, innocence, um, wrongful convictions, but also just, you know, like inadequate defence that happens in every community. And you talk to any um, black fella and they'll talk about the fact they were told to plead guilty. Like that's such a common story. Yeah. Um, so I think we're not even, yeah, I don't know, um, looking at law in a different way. Yeah. So not that you're necessarily a legal expert, but on your podcast curtain, um, you talk to Martin about some of those issues and I think you say they come up um, throughout the podcast but yeah the inadequate defense the lack of resources that go to Aboriginal legal services and things like that where you know it isn't justice if you know you can't access it properly and if people are being told to plead and, and those kinds of things what are some of those other issues that come up not in the necessarily the policing end of things but once things are already in train and you're within that justice system and within the courts can you tell us about some of those issues that um, that came up or that you've discussed in your podcast? Yeah, I mean, well, one of the things was around, um, definitely around the defence issue, because we just, we found like that was what happened in every part of it. And Kevin even didn't even have a proper appeal. You know, he wasn't given a proper appeal at all because he had the same defence lawyer. Um, so he didn't, at the very first part, he didn't have access to justice. The other thing I found, but this might be just in relation to Kevin's case, was that, you know, the appeal process, there was not after that appeal process went through and it was an adequate appeal, there was very few mechanisms um, afterwards. Um, but I think also I'm just looking at, you know, I was always comparing sort of the what happened to Kevin in the context of Barrival as well, because I'd reported a lot on Barrival. And just seeing how there were similar issues. So the Barrival children were never allowed a joint trial. That impacted the ability um, for a successful um, conviction or it impacted the way that that trial was run. The families always wanted that joint trial. In Kevin's case, there was a joint trial of um, four Aboriginal alleged um, 
defendants and that actually impacted Kevin's case. So I just see differences in the way. And a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, it's an equal law. It's actually not. When you look at so many different instances, it's just not like Aboriginal um, victims in particular are treated completely differently. And we see that in so many different cases. So I don't even look at it, you know, it's, it's about the victim, I think. And I think that's not often focused on enough as well, how it impacts that course of um, the course for justice. Yeah. Uh, Graham Turvey has asked, uh, could you shed any light on what recommendations of the Royal Commission are not being used to prevent deaths in custody in 2021? Well, I think the majority of the recommendations just have not been implemented at all. Um, and so that was still a fight that's still ongoing. Um, and I think sometimes we do have to look back into the Royal Commission um, and consider what was also the gaps that came out of the Royal Commission, because I think things have moved on um, that we're finding out more and more, particularly about the violence in the justice system. And I say that in the context of the health system and how it intersects with justice that I don't think when I read those past cases was brought out as much as it should have been in that original Royal Commission. So I think, you know, that's been the key thing. And I think this year, this April is the 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission to Aboriginal Death in Custody. Nothing has changed. In fact, it's gotten worse. But a lot of those um, cases that you look at, they could have happened today, which is really incredibly sad. So you see that there hasn't been those changes. Um, and then just in relation to like a more personal level, my dad was at the jail in Rockhampton pretty much in that period after the Royal Commission was occurring. And he said there were these cases, um, there were changes that were happening at the time and that they just gradually went away in the years afterwards. And the jail just went back to being, you know, the same. And so even if there were those, there's little changes that were being made after the Royal Commission, they went away. That was my dad's experience at the Rockhampton jail, where there was also a case that was investigated by the Royal Commission. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there hasn't been um, any, um, the large percentage, the majority of recommendations have never been um, implemented in states. Yeah. Um, the other thing uh, that we've been, uh, there's a lot of questions in here around uh, Aboriginal media, and you talked about, um, your passion in building up those things. So people are asking where they can go to for uh, good sources of news and reporting on these kinds of things. Do you want to just talk about, um, you know, uh, some of uh, the black publications or where they've got uh, good Aboriginal uh, journalists or writers on staff where people might go to for good information? I think one of the best places you can go to is community Aboriginal radio. Um, and like a key one, like an example I say is 98.9. .9. If you look through the archives of Let's Talk, Bo Spiram hosts it currently, but in the past, like Uncle Tiger Bells, who's passed away, used to, you see an archive, it's phenomenal. The um, amount of voices that are in there talking about a breadth of issues in, in ways that you just do not hear um, in the mainstream. And then we have like, we have a lot of um, really talented Aboriginal journalists coming up, um, but I'm really just keen on independent black media and building that up because I think sometimes we've got a lot of um, really talented journos in mainstream right now, which is really great that we've got that, um, those spaces, but you're still in a sense being confined um, by those news values that sometimes work against Aboriginal interests. And so I think, you know, listening to, you know, looking at Indigenous X, Koori Mail, um, 98.9 or your local um, community radio station, you find those voices um, out there. Um, yeah, but also like following individual journalists, you know, who are doing really good work, even, you know, in those publications and are working against um, those new, in their own capacity, I think is really important to, to draw out those differing voices, you know, like, um, yeah, there's just so many, like Lorena Alam at The Guardian, you've got um, Ella Archibald Binge is at ABC 730 Report. So finding out those individual voices as well who are working um, even in mainstream. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Claudia Craig and Claudia, I might hijack your question a bit here. She says, in relation to your point about Aboriginal people not being believed by police, that it's interesting that we are seeing more and more Aboriginal storytelling reaching the broader public through arts and community projects, um, which I do think is true. And I was just gonna, uh, before I get into the rest of uh, her question there, um, 
was going to ask you about the writer in residence program and I think last year in particular was a really difficult year for the arts community as a whole I'm sure including um, authors but as someone who you know doing a PhD you're a working journalist all those other things um, how important has it been to be connected to that community and to be able to participate in things like a writers in residence program at the Australia Institute to really stay connected and and um, help help your work I guess Oh, I think it was enormously helpful because I'm a mother as well of two young children. So I think during COVID period, it was just incredibly hard just to find those spaces, not just to write, but also to think. So I think just coming down to um, Canberra for two weeks really helped me do that. I think um, just having that space, I think sometimes particularly like for everyone last year, it was just a struggle to be able to carve out that time. Um, and also just, you know, a way you can think in the midst of all this anxiety in relation to what's happening in the world. So for me, it was really um, helpful, you know, and, and just to like go away for a little while and just reassess where you're going even into the new year. Um, yeah, I think I would encourage a lot of other people to apply. Yeah. Um, and so Claudia's question was, um, so we see more and more Aboriginal storytelling reaching the broader public, particularly through arts and community projects. Yeah, in real time uh, context, like the incidents that you've talked about in the justice system, there mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be that same receptiveness to hearing Aboriginal people and believing their stories. So can you come back to that idea of, um, you know, not being believed and not getting the benefit of the doubt and what we as a community can be doing to really elevate and amplify and believe those stories? Um. I'm not sure what, I mean, I think Australia has to go through, a. Com I mean, I think it's even bigger than that. I think it's just Australia has to go through this process um, where you go back to the heart of what actually happened because everything that, um, you know, the um, slandering of the black, was, it all has a purpose. It's all about land at the heart of it. It's all about this, this uncomfortableness around how Australia began. And it's also about what, you know, you look at so many things, it's all about keeping black followers from land, whether it's, you know, massacring but then contain like moving them into reserves missions and containing us through the um, incarceration and justice system you know it's all centrally about land and our rights to land um, so it comes down to that the fact that we've never dealt with that original unfinished business around what happened in this country and Australia is still very resistant to that so I, st I think that still bleeds into that and also obviously white supremacy and racism is totally ingrained it's how our structures are set up it's ingrained in everything. And so I think that, you know, you don't wanna believe people whose testimony get, goes against your own interests and whose aspirations work, uh, are directly against your own aspirations about this idea of what this country is supposed to be. It's a settler colony. Like, I think we have to start talk, calling it for what it is in every element because it affects everything. We're a settler colony and there was a purpose for what happened here. That was the elimination of Aboriginal mobs. So you're not going to believe us. So I think it comes down to that. So it seems like a, a wider question than that, but I become very cynical about, you know, I, I find it very cynical. I, I can be very cynical about that until we deal with, you know, those original original issues. I imagine that's why the Makarata included that truth telling. We need a process of truth telling about our history um, as one of its key, uh, I guess, invitations to the rest of Australia to be a part of that process because, yeah, we're still pretty incapable of, of telling the truth about. And we haven't even had a conversation about what that truth telling would look like and what it would involve because I think what happens after that is that there's still those attempts by white Australia to water it down. So you might say, okay, we'll give you that, but it's, you know, whether it's divorced from justice or calls from justice or a way to placate white guilt and move on. You know what I mean? So I think it also has to be like a very in-depth conversation in which white Australia starts listening to black Australia about what actually needs to happen in relation to truth telling. And sometimes I don't think we're not even there yet, because if you look at even just the fact that government was so resistant to even the idea of talking about Uluru, um, and we never had that proper conversation about anything about Uluru, what came out of it, what mob want, what mob don't want. There was nothing. It was just totally like the oxygen was cut off straight away before mm. we could even talk about it. So how can you listen when they're just saying we can't even talk about 
what this is happening and how this is going to happen, which is really where the cynicism comes from, I think. <laughs> very understandable. And you're right, the government really just dismissed that straight away and even things like the voice to parliament immediately became, well, what about, we don't want that, what about... Yeah, the tactics in which to silence it or change the narrative, and that's still ongoing, you know, it's still currently ongoing. So Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left Amy so is there anything else that you'd like to leave the audience with or any other issue that we think you know we haven't covered uh, that you'd like to to talk about oh I just want to say um like if you want to support Kevin Henry we have a GoFundMe so if you just google GoFundMe Kevin Henry like the money goes direct to him so it's yep. basically what we're using to support him um, while we get the exoneration process up just to help him heal and I sort of been saying, you know, like 29 years, those are your formative years, you know, and what happened with jailing him is, you know, it wasn't just, you know, all of that, the violence that come with that, it, it really robbed him of his potential. And what I found in this case is that people did not think that was an issue. You know, they, they saw this young Aboriginal kid who grew up in Worry, oh, he didn't have potential anyway. Well, you don't know that. He's a really phenomenal person. He's an amazing artist, but he's also just incredibly community minded. He's a pillar in so many ways to, for his community. And so that's what I find really upsetting is that they robbed him of his potential. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to say, you know, I'm just trying to help him um, in the years that he has. He, he's got a lot of years ahead of him. So if you want to support him, like Google GoFundMe, Kevin Henry, and the money goes direct to him. Um, it doesn't go to us or anything, but that's the way you can support him, which I would really encourage um, everyone to do if you hear his story and you want to help out in any way. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Amy. We really appreciate uh, all of it and good luck with your not one, but two books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, See you go. <laughs> was everything else we've got going. Um, we might tell everyone when uh, Amy's books come out. So uh, make sure that you're subscribed to uh, hear back from us and don't forget to check out Amy's podcast curtain as well. It started quite some time ago. Uh, but it's gripping and well worth listening to. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again, Amy. And thanks everyone for your great questions today. Uh, we do have more exciting webinars coming up in the next few weeks. Next week, we're talking to Professor Ross Garneau about his new book, Reset, Restoring Australia After the Pandemic Recession. And then on Wednesday, March the 3rd at 11, we're talking to Senator Jackie Lambie, the independent Senator from Tasmania, about the importance of the crossbench in Parliament. And just a reminder, uh, we're still in pandemic time, so stay one and a half metres away, keep washing your hands and stay safe out there, everyone. We hope to see you next week, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>